Hi everyone. Today we'll be exploring the growth of slavery in the antebellum period, the resistance to it by both black and white Americans, and the way that ideas about slavery and race were changing in the middle decades of the 19th century. If one thing drove the dramatic expansion of slavery in the years following the War of 1812, as we see here in our first image, it was cotton. It was the number one export of the United States, driving textile factories in the North and overseas in Europe. The price of slaves was tied to that of cotton on the exchanges of New York and London. On lands ripped from the Cherokee, Choctaws, Creeks, and other groups, the South built its empire of cotton. Somewhere around one million people, maybe even those we see in this early daguerreotype, were forcibly relocated from parts of the Upper South and placed on the expanding cotton fields of the Deep South and the Southwest as far as Texas and Arkansas between 1820 and 1860. Roughly 50% of these sales and relocations destroyed a nuclear family, often permanently separating children under the age of 13 from their parents. The landscape of the Mississippi Valley, once one of the richest agricultural areas on the planet, lost its fertility, becoming usable only for one thing, cotton. The South measured its wealth by the number of human beings it owned, and those people collateralized immense amounts of credit. Cotton may have been king, but it was the enslaved people who did the work that made the planters and the traders rich. What historians call the second middle passage, the domestic slave trade in the United States, the tearing of one million people from their families and loved ones in the upper south and selling them onto the cotton plantations of the lower south, was not something that went unnoticed by the American public and especially not by the slaves themselves. When criticism rose, slaveholders were put on the defensive. Well through the end of the 18th century and into the early 19th, slave owners who sought to defend slavery, like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, typically did so by apologizing for the institution, calling it an unwanted but necessary evil, and one they hoped would just fade away over time. As the sage of Monticello famously said, slavery was like holding a wolf by the ears. You didn't like it, but you didn't dare let it go. The explosion of cotton and the domestic slave trade forced a reimagining and reinvention of the standard defense of slavery by planters. John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, who we have here, perhaps the most outspoken of all the defenders of slavery in the antebellum years, led the way. Calhoun rejected the notion of slavery as a necessary evil, and instead argued that it was what he called a positive good, a moral and righteous institution that formed, in his estimation, the foundation of the entire American social order. In fact, without slavery and other forms of subjugation of the so-called inferior races, he suggested, white people could not be truly free, or at least not as free as they could and should be. Anglo-Saxon freedom rested upon the domination of inferior peoples. 
Furthermore, Calhoun and other defenders of slavery began to insist slaveholders were not tyrannical monsters who separated children from their mothers, but loving caretakers who generally treated their slaves like members of their own families. They were good masters and good mistresses who were genuinely concerned with the welfare of the people they owned. We can get an idea of this public image Southern planners began to present of themselves from this photograph. The master beams with self-pride, power, and satisfaction, while the people under his control all share a different expression. Clearly aware of the disparity in the power dynamics around them, they nevertheless glare into the camera, determined to be the individuals they are, in spite of their circumstances. James W.C. Pennington, who we see in this image, was an escaped fugitive from Maryland who made his way to freedom in New York City later becoming a minister and leader of the free black community there. In telling his story, Pennington gave the lie to the mythology of good Southern masters and mistresses by elaborating what he described as the chattel principle of slavery. He used the example of a slave owning family he knew back in Maryland, who in every way fit the depiction of the good master and mistress. They owned one adult female slave and her young daughter, who grew into a beautiful teenager. The family also had a son of their own, similar in age. By all accounts, the master and mistress treated their enslaved family well. But even in this model family, Pennington explained, the chattel principle, not the morality of good masters and good mistresses, reigned supreme. The family's son raped the daughter and impregnated her, a fact which the local community got wind of. Suddenly this model slave-owning family faced public humiliation and disgrace unless they got rid of the source of their problem. The son, as a white male slaveholder, could not be held accountable publicly. It was the young slave woman, the victim of the rape, who had brought the spotlight of shame on the family. If she were removed, then their good name, their public reputation could be restored. In short order, Papers were drawn up, and she was sold, away from the mother who adored and loved her, never to be seen again. In the end, no matter how well treated, when push came to shove, all slaves' lives operated not according to the mythology of good masters or mistresses, but in accordance with the chattel principle, which means quite simply and brutally, a person with a price. So how did enslaved people manage to endure and survive during the decades of the Second Middle Passage? There were no simple answers, but this image starts to provide an explanation. A rare photograph, not just because it's of actual slaves, but more because it shows several generations of a single enslaved family in Virginia that somehow managed to stay together. First and foremost, slaves relied upon their own families and despite the odds stacked against them, tried desperately to keep them together. But in the age of the domestic slave trade, this was frequently impossible. So enslaved communities had to create other tools for survival. One of them was the advent of so-called fictive kin networks, 
composed of people who, although not blood related, stood in to fill the roles of parents, grandparents, brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles, and cousins. The chances were high, at least 50%, that a slave living in the Upper South would be sold during the antebellum period, or see someone close to them sold, at least once, and often multiple times. Because this was the stark reality they faced, fictive kinship became in every conceivable way as important as blood relations. That enslaved people everywhere rallied around, supported, cared for, and adopted strangers into their communities says all we need to know in some ways about their commitment to family and the importance they placed upon it. A final element in the toolkit slaves possessed for their survival was their faith in God. And by the middle decades of the 19th century, for most of them, this meant a belief in Christianity. But it was not the same version of the religion native-born white Americans adhered to. Whether enslaved or free, Black Americans found their inspiration from the Bible, not in the New Testament commandment of Jesus for slaves to obey their masters, but more in the Old Testament story of Exodus, of God's chosen people, the Hebrews, being delivered out of slavery, and of God's vengeance on the Pharaoh of Egypt, who tried to keep them in bondage. Some African Americans at the time found their hope in the Book of Revelations, which spoke about the final judgment of God upon the wicked. Black Christianity focused not just upon the sufferings of God's chosen people, but upon their deliverance in this world, not the next. It was a theology of liberation and empowerment, of imagination, in a world that sought to confine and restrict the boundaries of all those things in the lives of black people in the United States, free or enslaved. Between 1822 and 1831, the South experienced several disturbances related to slavery that impacted the entire region and ultimately the country at large. First in 1822 was Denmark Vesey's conspiracy in Charleston, South Carolina, which, if it had not been discovered, promised to become the largest and bloodiest uprising of slaves in American history. In 1829, another free black man, and some believe disciple of Vesey, David Walker, published in Boston an anti-slavery pamphlet that became in its time the most notorious publication in the country, calling as it did for slaves to rise up in bloody revolution and destroy the white master class of the South. And finally, in 1831, Southerners' worst fears were realized when a slave from Southampton County, Virginia, Nat Turner, succeeded where Vesey had failed, launching an insurrection that led to the deaths of slaveholders, including men, women, and children, before it was put down. And Turner and his followers, like the martyred Denmark Vesey and his associates, were tried and executed. The known facts of David Walker's early biography are sparse, but suggestive. Here we have an artist's sketch interpretation of him. He was born in or near Wilmington, North Carolina, the son of a slave father and a free black mother. Thus, under the laws of slavery, he was born free. The year of Walker's birth is uncertain, although the most convincing research places it about 1797. By his own account in the appeal, 
Walker left Wilmington as a literate young man and wandered around the United States, residing for some years in Charleston, South Carolina, where he was at the time of Denmark Vesey's failed conspiracy. In 1825, he turned up in Boston, Massachusetts, where he would spend the rest of his abbreviated life. By resettling in the North, Walker left behind scenes of slavery, but not of racial inequality. Blacks, mainly petty shopkeepers and semi-skilled workers and their families, accounted for barely 3% of Boston's population in 1825. They faced numerous civil disabilities. Under Massachusetts law, Blacks were barred from holding legislative office and from serving as constables or jurors. As in other northern cities, they also faced discrimination in a variety of public accommodations and services, including, as Walker noted bitterly in his appeal, unequal schooling for their children. After his arrival in Boston, he made many contacts with prominent black residents who were involved in anti-slavery work. By the end of 1828, Walker was the city's most important black anti-slavery propagandist, even working as an agent in submitting articles for the country's first black newspaper in New York, Freedom's Journal, which we have a copy of here. It's unclear when, exactly, Walker struck upon the idea of using his clothing business and his access to the sailor's world as a means of spreading his anti-slavery message. At his shop near the docks, sailors looked for cheap clothing for their upcoming voyages, and Walker supplied them with used items, many of them obtained from other sailors who'd sold them to Walker for ready cash. It was a simple matter to collect batches of printed material, sew them into the linings of the clothing, and have them carried off undetected by sympathetic sailors bound for Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans. Within days, copies of anti-slavery literature could be sent across the South, spreading out from the ports along river routes to literate blacks who could relay the message to the slaves at large. In September 1829, Walker published the first edition of his appeal, which we see here, and began sending copies southward. Two revised editions appeared over the next nine months. The chief aim of Walker's appeal was to inspire American blacks with a vision of hope and pride and a prophecy of the destruction of the American status quo. Walker lamented the fatalism of so many slaves and free blacks, an attitude of resignation and servility that he blamed mainly on white oppression, but one in which he believed blacks themselves were complicit. Not only did black Americans submit to the lash and numerous subtler outrages, some were so hopeless that they willingly betrayed their braver brothers and sisters who chose to resist. It was time, Walker announced, to face up to the fact that, as he put it, we colored people of these United States are the most wretched, degraded, and abject set of beings that ever lived since the world began. Likewise, it was time for blacks to unite and fight back in accordance with the word of God. But first, they had to understand fully the depths of their degradation and the various ways that white America kept them degraded. Hypocrisy with respect to equality was America's chief sin. And Walker declared, God would not suffer that hypocrisy to continue. 
it was his prophecy of impending warfare and of slavery's doom that most deeply shocked white Southerners. Walker was imprecise about how his prediction would unfold. In the preamble to the appeal, he suggested that the slaves themselves might not lead the attack, but that God would cause the whites to rise up one against another with sword in hand. In retrospect, these lines, written three decades before the Civil War, seem clairvoyant. More often, Walker envisioned a black uprising or a series of uprisings that would slay the oppressors, root them out, in his words. And in the passages that Southern officials read with the utmost alarm, Walker encouraged his audience to throw off the psychological weight of servility and prepare to fight like men. Walker proffered no details on how to wage an insurrection, but he was writing as God's messenger, not as his strategist or field commander. The appeal was meant to clear the way, to pierce the fog of submissiveness that Walker had discovered in his travels, to inform blacks of their proud heritage stretching back centuries to Africa, to evangelize among the lowly as John the Baptist had evangelized, and to set their sights on liberation and the coming of the Lord. In a concise pamphlet, small enough to be smuggled in batches inside a sailor's coat, Walker combined political argument, historical reflection, and black Christianity in a powerful condemnation of the United States as he knew it. David Walker's efforts ended in a final mystery. In June 1830, he put a third edition of the appeal through the press. Defying the mounting outcries from Southerners and Northerners alike, rumors had started to circulate that slaveholders in the South had put out a price of $3,000 for Walker's head, a price that would rise to 10000 if he were delivered to a slave state alive. Walker's friends pleaded with him to flee to Canada, but he refused. Then, on August 3rd, 1830, he suddenly died at his home. No convincing evidence has ever come to light to show that his death was unnatural, but many observers at the time could not help but conclude that he'd somehow been murdered, perhaps poisoned. David Walker's greatest legacy was to convince free blacks in the North and anti-slavery whites that the fight against human bondage in America had to be taken to a higher level. Some have speculated that he may have inspired an enslaved preacher and mystic in Virginia, Nat Turner, to fulfill his own prophecy of blood for the slaveholding whites of the South. All his life, Nat Turner imagined in this sketch, presented himself and was accepted by the black community where he lived as a man apart, a figure with extraordinary abilities, destined for some special purpose. Even as a child of three or four, Turner's mother overheard him describe events that had occurred before his birth. She declared that one day he would be a prophet. Similarly, his parents had noted certain marks on his head and chest and told him it was a sign that he was intended for some great purpose. Turner's grandmother, his master, and many others repeatedly remarked that his extraordinary intelligence made him, in their words, unfit to be a slave. As a young man, Nat Turner simultaneously devoted himself to the mastery of sacred 
and secular knowledge, demonstrating spontaneously an ability to read, experimenting with the manufacture of paper and gunpowder, and cultivating an austere lifestyle of religious devotion, fasting, and prayer. His unusual manner, talents, and interests set him apart and marked him as a leader in the black community of Southampton County, Virginia. No evidence exists that Nat Turner's life was distinguished by any sort of unusual brutality from a master. He did not undertake his revolt as an act of revenge against a particular person. Nat Turner's enemy was slavery as a whole, not just a single master. He was born on October 2nd, 1800, the slave of Benjamin Turner, one of many small farmers in the county of Southampton. When Benjamin Turner died in 1810, Nat Turner passed into the hands of Benjamin's brother, Samuel. On the death of Samuel in 1822, he was sold to another local man, Thomas Moore. When this new master died in 1828, Turner became the property of Moore's nine-year-old son, Putnam. Two years later, Thomas Moore's widow married a carriage maker named Joseph Travis. At the time of his revolt in August of 1831, Nat Turner was still the legal property of the boy, Putnam Moore, but his effective master was Joseph Travis. It was some time during the early 1820s, by his own account, that Turner first began to experience a series of religious revelations or visions. One day, while praying, the spirit, the same spirit which he believed spoke to the prophets in former days, visited him and repeated one of his favorite scriptural passages. Seek ye the kingdom of heaven, and all things shall be added unto you. This vision was repeated two years later, setting Nat Turner on the course that culminated in the Southampton insurrection of 1831. From his early childhood until his execution by the state of Virginia, Turner had found in his life and in the natural world a series of signs to be interpreted. The comments that he would become a prophet or that he was unfit for slavery, the marks on his head and chest, his ability to read without being taught, and finally the revelation instructing him to seek the kingdom of heaven. These signs all seemed to point in a single direction. God had commanded him to lead his people in a great battle against slavery. This sketch depicts him plotting with his conspirators. Turner's early revelations were followed by others, all pushing him closer and closer toward a revolt. Joseph Travis and his family attended church services on Sunday, August 22nd, and arrived home near midnight. Soon afterwards, Turner entered the house through a second story window, unbarred the door to let in the other rebels, and they proceeded to murder the entire family. Salanthiel Francis, the owner of the rebels Sam and Will, was the next victim killed in his farmhouse 600 yards away. As Turner and his followers moved from farm to farm, they gathered muskets, swords, and other weapons, and their numbers slowly increased from seven to 15 to 40 to 60. No white person, man, woman, or child was spared along their route. For several hours, the rebels met no resistance, but by morning, 
the alarm was spreading in the neighborhood, and the whites were hastily organizing. A small militia unit confronted Turner and his men on Monday afternoon at Parker's Field, three miles from the town of Jerusalem. They were soon reinforced by a second group. In the engagement, most of Turner's band was captured or tried to flee. A smaller fight the next morning resulted in the capture or surrender of all the remaining rebels, except Turner himself, who escaped. Nat Turner remained at large for over two months before finally being captured and taken into custody on October 31st, 1831, a moment depicted in this sketch. He was tried on November 5th and hanged six days later. Somewhere around 60 whites had been killed during the insurrection, more than half of them women and children. Between 60 and 80 slaves had joined Turner's revolt, along with at least four free blacks, one of whom, a man named Bill Artis, in order to avoid execution or sale into slavery, walked into the woods, placed his hat on a stake, and shot himself. For several days after the revolt had ended, white vigilantes and even members of the state militia units began an indiscriminate massacre of blacks in Southampton County, whether they'd been part of the uprising or not. For some time after Turner's rebellion, just having black skin was considered evidence of guilt and complicity, and hundreds of innocent African Americans were tortured and murdered, far surpassing the violence and slaughter of the insurrection itself. Between the time he was captured on October 31st and his execution on November 11th, Turner gave a series of interviews to one of the white attorneys serving as a public defender at the trials of the rebels, Thomas R. Gray. For days, Gray questioned Turner in his cell while he awaited trial and then hanging. Gray soon published this material as the Confessions of Nat Turner, which we have an original copy of here. The document forms the basis for most of what we know about Nat Turner from his own perspective. He reportedly went to his execution with dignity and composure, refusing an invitation to make a final statement to the large crowd of angry and vengeful whites that had gathered to watch him die. The haunting fear of slave revolt was deeply embedded in the white Southern mind. It never faded as long as slavery existed. As one Virginia slaveholder fearfully noted at the time, a Nat Turner might be in any family. Clearly, black Christianity offered slaves revolutionary possibilities that masters had good reason to worry about. Anti-slavery whites in the North viewed Turner's insurrection as a price the South was bound to pay at some point for maintaining and holding on to the sin of slavery. A large part of what drove people to oppose slavery in the antebellum period was the fact that the domestic traffic in people made slavery a much more public, meaning visible, institution than ever before. It was almost impossible as a traveler anywhere in the slave states, no matter how big or small the town, to avoid seeing people sold at market, in auctions, open to everyone. These were anything but hidden events. New Orleans was the great slave trading capital 
of the second middle passage. His people were moved there first, and then shipped to destinations throughout the South's empire of cotton. As this illustration shows, even in New Orleans City Hall, people were openly bought and sold. It was a regular thing to open a newspaper and see an ad like this one offering ready cash for men, women, and children. The fastest growing career in the antebellum years, outside of being a minister, was becoming a slave trader. Almost overnight, it seemed, a whole class of individuals emerged, some of whom became rich, not by owning slaves, but by selling them for a living. Here we have an example of the kind of records that slave traders kept. And in this photograph, we have a group of slave traders gathered together for a picture at a Kentucky slave market. When people were brought to the market for sale, they were typically kept in holding pens, like the ones we see in these photographs. They were kept in these holding pens until the time of an auction, or sometimes were dressed up and made to advertise themselves out in front of slave trading establishments, right on the street for every passerby to see, whether they wanted to or not. Here we have a couple of more photographs that serve to illustrate the public face of slavery in the antebellum period. This is the storefront of a typical slave trading business during the era. Right next to it are establishments selling lamp oils and cigars. People are just one among a variety of commodities available for purchase. Slave trading is not hidden from view, but set right in among other businesses openly in the public marketplace. This more expanded view of the same storefront is even more revealing, because although the streets are dirty and the area looks run down, this was not the shady part of town. As we can see, fine chinaware was being sold right above the slave trader's business. If you were a Southern Belle planning a dinner party and you wanted a new set of plates, you had to visit the slave traders as well. It was unavoidable. In the early 1830s, many white anti-slavery advocates in the North embracing the reform spirit of the era and the dream of perfecting society started arguing for the immediate abolition of slavery with no compensation to slaveholders that they began to see as criminals what they called men stealers abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison in Boston who we have here envisioned a country where black freedom rather than being an aberration, a departure from the norm, was the universal law of the land. The uncompromising energy and urgency of the radical abolition message 
played quite effectively with many white reformers in the North. After reading Garrison's appeals in his anti-slavery newspaper, The Liberator, which we have an example of here, a number of important Northerners came to agree with Garrison that slavery and racial prejudice, not black freedom in America, represented the greatest threat to social order in the country. Theodore Dwight Weld, who we have here, observed at the time that the cause of immediate abolition, in his words, not only overshadows all others, but absorbs them into itself. In his opinion, religious revivals and the cause of moral reform generally would, as he put it, remain stationary until the temple by which he meant the country, had been cleansed of slavery. Between just 1831 and 1833, the abolitionist movement cited a number of major accomplishments, from the founding of the New England Anti-Slavery Society to the expansion of anti-slavery societies throughout the North, from only four in two states in 1831 to 47 in 10 states by 1833. The movement gained still more momentum when Garrison and his liberator gained the financial backing of the wealthy New York businessmen, the Tappan brothers, Arthur, who we see in this image, and Louis Tappan in this one. There were also a number of prominent women who by the later part of the 1830s had become well-recognized as abolitionists, including the Quaker reformer, Lucretia Mott, who we see here, and the Grimke sisters, Sarah and Angelina, who we see in this image. They grew up as the daughters of a wealthy slave-owning South Carolina family converted to Quakerism in the 1820s and moved north to become outspoken opponents of slavery. No doubt the Garrisons, Tappans, Welds, Motts, and Grimkes of the radical abolitionist ranks drew the most attention from the press of the time, but the real shock troops of the movement were free blacks in the North. People like James W.C. Pennington and David Walker. But no free black figure had the impact, both in the fight against slavery and on the nation that sustained it, as Frederick Douglass, who we see here in his younger years. From the earliest period of his public career, Douglass knew that whether in the slave South or the free North to which he'd liberated himself, literacy was power. The 19th century Western world owed much of its values and mores to the 18th century Enlightenment's faith in human reason and its assertion of individual rights. To be judged truly human and a citizen with social and political recognition, therefore, a person had to achieve literacy. For better or worse, civilization itself was equated with cultures that could literally write their history. The act of writing for a former slave constituted in a very real sense the creation of a public historical self. Douglas was hired by William Lloyd Garrison and the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society to be a traveling lecturer, first around New England and eventually across the North. Douglas found his voice and his calling. In the early 1840s, on almost countless platforms, Douglas began to tell the free story that he would soon publish to great acclaim. Here we have an original copy of Douglas's narrative, first printed 
1841. In it, he tries to describe the most terrible meanings of slavery, its existence outside any law or social control, and its capacity to render African-American life of no value. One of his favorite techniques was to connect his personal story to the plight of the nation at large. At the end of his narrative, Douglas closes with a passage from Jeremiah. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A major argument of Douglas's story, and something he would repeat in many forms right up to the Civil War, is that the prison of slavery housed both blacks and whites, slaves and slaveholders, the entire nation in a single fate. Beginning in the late 1830s and increasingly in the 1840s, free black leaders in the North began to disagree among themselves over the tactics being employed to fight for American citizenship rights and against slavery. They began to clash over whether strict adherence to the strategy of moral suasion was sufficient to combat racism and slavery, or whether more direct, political, even confrontational measures were needed. In general, this debate divided the two great free black centers in the North, Philadelphia and New York. In Pennsylvania, free black leaders remained predominantly loyal to William Lloyd Garrison's brand of abolitionism, which demanded a strict adherence to the strategy of moral suasion in the anti-slavery struggle. But in New York, black activists began making the case that moral suasion and racial improvement were only part of what was needed to fight against slavery. The power of the press, black New Yorkers argued, should be employed to convince the public not just to sympathize with them and oppose slavery, but to start taking concrete political measures toward the final annihilation of the institution. The emergence of the first anti-slavery political parties in the 1840s, the Liberty Party, and later the Free Soil Party, highlighted the divisions within the black, abolition, black abolitionist ranks over the issue of moral suasion versus political action. Those who, like Garrison, supported moral suasion alone as a strategy for fighting against racism and slavery, interpreted the United States Constitution as a pro-slavery document. They argued that the federal government's protection of slavery made clear that there was no point in engaging the formal political process through traditional avenues. Only a sea change in public opinion on the issue of slavery and prejudice against blacks generally, they believed, could finally eradicate slavery. Free black leaders in the North inclined to political activism, especially those in New York, took encouragement from the formation of the Liberty Party, which made its stand upon the Declaration of Independence and an anti-slavery interpretation of the Constitution. At the end of the 1830s, free blacks had lost their voting rights in Pennsylvania in the 1840s, they possessed the suffrage only in the New England states of Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, and in New York with property qualifications. This explained a large part of the appeal of the Liberty Party to politically inclined free blacks in the North, because the party consistently agitated for black political rights and for their acceptance as American citizens. 
In places where blacks did enjoy voting rights, questions of racial injustice became the focus of Liberty Party meetings and gatherings. The party also voiced an opposition to segregated schools, discrimination on boats and trains, as well as other prejudices blacks suffered. The Liberty Party appealed to many free blacks because it did more than simply preach equality. It welcomed them into the operations of the movement. At Liberty Party gatherings in the 1840s, blacks were generally treated equally and mingled freely with white anti-slavery activists. A final element in the party's popularity with free blacks was its consistent campaign to eradicate the infamous black laws from northern state constitutions, measures that imposed special disabilities on African Americans, such as prohibiting them from testifying against whites, serving on juries, and sending their children to public schools. James G. Burney, who we see here, was the Liberty Party's candidate for president in 1840 and 1844. He argued in both campaigns, the latter of which we have a broadside from here, that Black's condition was not due to any inherent racial inferiority, but their exclusion from the political life of the nation. Free Blacks' participation in Liberty Party politics in the 1840s greatly expanded and strengthened their sense of themselves as Americans. In terms of practical political results, however, the Liberty Party had little success in extending the suffrage rights of free blacks in the North. The issue went down to defeat time after time in state constitutional conventions. The only success was in Rhode Island. The forecast for black voting rights was in fact worse by the end of the 1840s than it had been at the outset of the decade. The short life of the party was due to internal divisions within the ranks of white anti-slavery activists. Some like the Garrisonians, disagreed over whether the Constitution authorized the abolition of slavery where it currently existed, and others wanted to broaden the party's appeal beyond agitating the issue of slavery. Finally, differences of opinion about the possibility of building a coalition with the major political parties, should they ever change their position on the abolition of slavery, work to destabilize and ultimately destroy the Liberty Party by the end of the decade. When the Free Soil Party formed in 1848, it remained an anti-slavery movement, but the commitment to ending slavery in the South and fighting for black civil rights in the North was dropped. Here we have a Free Soil poster from the period. The party became more interested in winning exclusively white support and in broadening its popular appeal. As the question of slavery in the territories took center stage again in the aftermath of Texas annexation, the arguments of anti-slavery politicians in the North became less and less focused upon attacking slavery in the South and more targeted towards preventing its extension into any new regions of the country. It did not take long for free black leaders to discern this change in emphasis. And as a result, they were far more suspicious of the free soil movement than they had been of the Liberty Party. If the Liberty Party had embraced the idea of citizenship and voting rights, and accepted free blacks as Americans, the Free Soil Party did not. It sought to define them outside the boundaries of the nation's political life. Third party anti-slavery politics, which had seemed to offer so much hope and possibility at the outset of the 1840s, 
By the end of the decade, it had become an obstacle to black citizenship rights in the North and to the abolition of slavery in the South. As Frederick Douglass noted, the Free Soil Movement promised much, but performed little. More than anything, it became an obstacle to abolition. As Douglass concluded in his words, no abolitionist who is truly such will be gratified with or encourage any measure that does not contemplate slavery everywhere is marked out for destruction. It is a foul system at war with the happiness of man and the laws of God, and there must be no compromise with it. Unfortunately for abolitionists and fighting against slavery and the antebellum era, they were up against more than just the economic explosion of cotton the second middle passage and American race prejudice. They were also battling simultaneously religious ideas and pseudo-scientific notions, some of which had been around seemingly forever, the religious ones, and some only then coming into vogue based in so-called science. Religious notions pervaded pro-slavery literature Three kinds of religious arguments on behalf of slavery were the most common. To Southerners steeped in the Bible and predisposed to look to precedent for guidance, the fact that the ancient Hebrews, God's chosen people, owned slaves, and that Jesus, who was not hesitant to condemn behavior that he considered immoral, never criticized slavery or reproached anyone for owning slaves, seemed to provide clear divine sanction for the peculiar institution. So too did the special biblical precedent provided by Noah's curse of his son Ham, portrayed in this painting. A story that white Southerners frequently cited to indicate God's condemnation of the black so-called Hamitic peoples, to eternal slavery. And finally, many pro-slavery writers and speakers argued simply that slavery was part of God's plan to expose a hitherto heathen people to the blessings of Christianity. Biblical history traced the origin of human diversity back to the time of the flood and the story of Noah, specifically his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet, seen as the forebears, respectively, of Asia, Africa, and Europe. According to the narrative in the Old Testament book of Genesis, after Ham scorned his father Noah's drunkenness and nakedness, Noah proceeded to pass judgment upon Ham's youngest son, Canaan, declaring, Cursed be Canaan, and a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Europeans used the story of Ham to justify the existence of the Atlantic slave trade and slavery in the Americas. It provided perhaps the most important conventional defense of slavery. By the 1830s, with the rise of the abolitionist movement, Noah's curse had become a stock weapon in the arsenal of pro-slavery politicians, writers, and speakers. The story mattered so much to slavery's defenders because it provided the justification for black enslavement missing from other biblical texts. Along with these religious justifications for slavery, starting in the late 1830s and 1840s, a number of prominent academics began to claim scientific foundations 
for differences between the races, for what they characterized as Anglo-Saxon, meaning white superiority, and the inherent inferiority of the darker races of humanity. So influential were these so-called studies that over the course of the 1840s, a belief in white superiority and the inferiority of darker races, especially those of the African stock, came to be accepted as scientific facts by many white Americans. In 1839, Samuel George Morton, who we see here, released the seminal work in what would become known as the American School of Ethnology, his Crania Americana. In this study, which we have a copy of here, Morton argued that by comparing cranial size, capacity, and structure, trained experts like himself could interpret the basic physical differences between the races. Morton also contended that there had been various creations of human beings in different parts of the world, and his research, dramatized by his display of the world's largest collection of human skulls in Philadelphia, was viewed as fundamental to an understanding of human racial origins until Darwin shattered the work of the American school in the 1860s. Morton was at the core of a group of writers that included the archaeologist Ephraim G. Squire, who we see in this image. There was also the southern-born physician Josiah C. Knott, captured here, and the English-born Egyptologist George R. Glidden, seen in this photograph. What made Morton and the other writers of the American schools work controversial was the assertion of polygenesis, the explanation of multiple creations of human beings that challenged the account given in the Old Testament. This is a page from Knott and Glidden's work, Types of Mankind. What was not at all seen as problematic by most whites was Morton and his colleagues' claim that the African race had always historically occupied an inferior position to that of the European Caucasian race. Perhaps the most popular work of the American school was Morton's 1844 treatise, Crania Egyptica, in which he said that while black Africans were more than numerous in ancient Egypt, they'd always been nothing more than servants and slaves, while the ruling class, the pharaohs, he argued, had all been white. Nothing highlighted the insidious nature of pseudoscientific racism in the life of the nation as much as the debate surrounding the country's sixth official census report gathered over the course of 1840 and released to the public in 1841. We have a copy of it here. The 1840 census was the first in the country's history to try and measure the number of mentally diseased and defective or insane and idiots, to use the contemporary terms of the day. Academics of the period concerned with the question of mental disorders eagerly awaited the results. As one of them declared, the hope was to receive a complete and accurate account 
of the prevalence of insanity among 17 millions of people, a sample size from which definitive results might actually be obtained, not only on the total number of so-called lunatics and idiots, but their breakdown according to race. However, as not a few northern scholars noted, the census had been corrected in the Department of State before being released to the public. They alluded to the fact that the Secretary of State, who at the time happened to be John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, captured again here, was responsible for the findings of the census. When the Harvard-educated physician and co-founder of the American Statistical Association, Edward Jarvis, a professional specialist in mental disorders, examined the data in an 1844 study entitled Insanity Among the Colored Population of the Free States. His reaction was one of disappointment and outrage. Here we have an image of Jarvis. According to the Sixth Census, the rate of insanity among free blacks was 11 times greater than among slaves in the South, with only one in 1,158 of those enslaved being recorded as insane, compared to a ratio of 1 in 144 among free blacks in the North. Even more remarkably, the frequency of these afflictions decreased from Maine to Louisiana with virtual mathematical precision. As Jarvis explained, in Maine, every 14th Negro, in Michigan, every 27th, in New Hampshire, every 28th, and in Massachusetts, every 43rd Negro was found to be insane, while New Jersey was discovered to possess the lowest rate of so-called idiocy among the northern states for free blacks, with a rate of one in every 297. These numbers stood in stark contrast to the experience of enslaved blacks in the South, where a trend nevertheless continued. Virginia came in with one of every 1,229 slaves listed as insane, South Carolina with one of every 2,477, and Louisiana one of every 4,310. Such statistics gave official credence to popular scientific ideas about the peculiar suitability of black people for slavery. Indeed, the 1840 census not only backed up the claims of pseudoscientific racists like Samuel George Morton and the other writers within the American School of Ethnology, it argued effectively that the deeper black people ventured into the hell of slavery. Incredibly, the more sound of mind they became. Among the errors in the statistics Jarvis pointed out was the fact that in numerous cases, significant numbers of insane blacks were found in northern counties where, in reality, no black people lived at all, or where the number of so-called idiots surpassed the actual number of free blacks living in specific communities. How far these errors respecting insanity among the blacks extend beyond those which we've already pointed out, we have no means of ascertaining, said Jarvis. But here are enough to destroy all our confidence in the accuracy of the whole. In 1844, Jarvis and other Northern academics, along with white and black abolitionists, petitioned Congress asking 
that the blatant errors in the census be corrected so that its findings in relation to insanity among blacks in a state of slavery and freedom might be officially and irrefutably discredited. Despite Senate and House reports which conceded the errors Jarvis highlighted, no revision of the 1840 census was forthcoming. As Secretary of State Calhoun informed the petitioners, Congress, and the nation, in his words, on a review of the whole, the correctness of the late census, in exhibiting a far greater prevalence of the diseases of insanity, blindness, deafness, and dumbness, stands unimpeachable. That it may contain errors, more or less, is hardly to be doubted. It would be a miracle if such a document, with so many figures and entries, did not. But that they have, if they exist, materially affected the correctness of the general result would seem hardly possible. The 1840 census, he insisted, clearly established that for the Negro or African race, freedom was a curse instead of a blessing. Free black writers in the North fully recognized the census as an attempt to add yet another layer of perceived legitimacy upon the findings of white pseudoscientists, especially their claims about the supposed natural inferiority of blacks. James McCune Smith, pictured here, first in the New York Tribune and later in Garrison's Liberator, took on the task of refuting the claims of the census. As he put it, freedom has not made us mad. It has strengthened our minds by throwing us upon our own resources and has bound us to American institutions with a tenacity which nothing but death can overcome. Black writers of the time noted how the census and studies by white pseudoscientists worked in tandem to justify in the white mind a feeling that black people, as a result of this supposed natural racial inferiority elaborated by academics, were unfit for freedom. The effect was to portray free blacks as a people that could never truly be incorporated into the national body as true citizens, as real Americans, and slavery as the normative condition of black people's lives. Okay, that does it for today. Next time we'll talk more about slavery as the primary cause and the buildup to the Civil War.